So this would push down, push its light liquid over the top and into the heavy liquid, which would then mix and go back into the tube. What he failed to understand was after a while, in fact, almost immediately, what would happen was there'd be in the tube and outside the tube a layer of very heavy liquid and in the inside just a top. So it essentially reached equilibrium. Is everybody following me so far? Just to think about it. Excellent. Water actually did provide a lot of interesting attempts by people in terms of special motion machines. This is called the Archimedean screw system. Does anybody know what an Archimedean screw is? Okay, an Archimedean screw is a device designed to pump water higher. Essentially, the amount of energy required to lift water one meter is always going to be equal to the weight, the mass of the water times g times h, in this case one meter. So what some people realized was that by increasing the distance over which you're doing it by adding a horizontal slant, you could decrease the energy required at any given second, the power required to pump it up. So it's essentially the difference between writing a paper in like one day as opposed to writing it in one week. You're still getting a paper done, except you're expending more effort over a shorter period of time, or in this case, less effort over a longer period of time. The wheel works by spinning, and then water enters the screw and eventually gets to the top. So what some people realize they could do is pump up water using the Archimedean screw and then pour it over a water wheel, which would then power the Archimedean screw. The problem with this is that the water wheel can only liberate energy in the water already. So you cannot get more energy than gravitational potential energy of the water at the top. In other words, trying to make this a bit more clear, you cannot use, you, if, you, if there's water at the very top of the water wheel and it comes down, the amount of energy the water wheel can generate from that could not be more than what's required to bring the water up to the top. At which point prob things with problems with friction and such would then, you know, cause energy loss. Of course, Boyle system, Bernoulli system, and Archimedean screw systems are not the only things people have tried to use water in order to create professional motion. Specifically, they also tried overbalanced wheels. <laughs> this, is the, this is a typical arch typical setup, I believe, from the 1600s. These, these were floaters. They were less. They were. They weighed less than water did. So what happened was, as a floater would reach the water system, it would rise and weigh less on this side than the floaters would on this side. So essentially, perpetual overbalancing. And this actually would work. This side will always be lighter than this side. The problems are twofold. One, you can't really keep the water in very well. He kind of glossed over that with this magic filter system. And more importantly, the energy required to bring a floater into the water is going to slow down the system. It requires more energy to bring the water, in, in other words, it requires more energy to bring the floater in than you'll get from the floater rising from the top. This is very similar being called a sponge wheel. It used sponges instead of floaters, which had its own problems. This is again a similar system using the buoyancy problem as essentially this except less complicated. This is actually a fairly interesting setup. I believe it was written, made by William Schaefer in the 1700s. What it would do is, on this end, the weights would be highly compressed. And on this end, they would expand with air, pumped in from here, and therefore rise to the top. This was actually a very interesting system because the problem could be in one of two places. First of all, if the natural state of the weights was to be compressed, then you, you have to use energy expanding them, which would solve the perpetual motion problem. On the other hand, if the state was naturally expanded, like it would be here, then you require energy to compress them. Either way, you lose. And this is just another setup of that system, I believe coming from the 1600s. Now, it should be noted that not all attempts at perpetual motion are futile. This is called the Cox clock. It was made in around the 1760s. This clock is rather famous for being worked non-stop from about 1760s to the 1840s, when it was dismantled and lost to humanity. It later resurfaced around 1968 and is now held in the Victorian Albert Museum. This clock, simply put, ran forever. Is it perpetual motion? Actually, it is not. This clock used a rather simple system of, actually rather clever system, of using a mercury barometer to wind the clock up. What would happen is, as the pressure in the day changed over long periods of time, it would create just enough of a rise in the mercury to rewind the spring. Essentially, it stole energy from the atmosphere. 
This is not actually perpetual motion. Even though the clock will last longer than all of our lifetimes combined, eventually it'll slow, and slow down and stop because eventually the atmosphere will eventually disappear. Now, you can't buy these clocks nowadays even though we're pretty sure how to build them. The reason why is actually this, the mercury. The clock required about 150 pounds of mercury. In other words, this clock's winding mechanism weighed more than I did. Instead, we have something called the Atmos clock, which works on heat differentials and can be put onto a desk. These are actually made by a company called Atmos, who I believe created them around the 1990s and still regularly sells them. Now at this point, it should be interesting that most of these people who built these clocks were very well-attentioned people. They honestly thought they could reach perpetual motion and devoted their entire lives to it in most cases. This person, Charles Redheffer, was not one of these people. He produced his perpetual motion machine in 1812, bringing it to Philadelphia and making it killing off showing it to people. People thought it was this um, part was perpetual motion machine and turned this gear to show how the machine worked forever and would never slow down. Eventually, people realized that he had put a trick into it. This was completely unpowered. This gear had a slight motor in it which turned the perpetual motion machine. He fled to Philadelphia and reopened a shop in New York in 1816, once again drawing huge crowds. This time, he worked out this bug and there was no such device and had no motor in it. Instead, one engineer broke into his attic and found a guy turning a crank and eating crust of bread. <laughs> yeah. It was shortly after this that scientists went to hell with this and invented the laws of thermodynamics. Because of crust of bread? Yes, because of crust of bread. Laws of thermodynamics were mostly complete by, or at least the basic laws that prevent perpetual motion machine, the first and second laws, were mostly complete by the 1850s and were primarily inspired by the fact that no professional machine ever worked. Nowadays, we have some independent confirmation on why these laws are true, or at least how they're true, which means that we can use them as an attack against professional motion machine. Before, fairly recently, like the past 100 years or so, we could not use thermodynamics because we had based them off professional motion machines. In a sense, saying, this professional motion machine does not work because of thermodynamics was circular, because we knew thermodynamics worked because of professional motion machines not. Now, obviously the laws of thermodynamics would have been a major blow to perpetual motion machines. Not really. This, is called, this was called the Keeley motor, and it came around 1876. Since it was fairly obvious that perpetual motion machines didn't work, Keeley got smart. He told everybody he had found a way of liberating call, something called the etheric vapors inside water which had so much power that a single cup of water could, could take an ocean liner around the world seven times. Naturally, he got huge crowds and massive amounts of funding. funding. And when the Keeley Motor Company opened up in, I believe, was it 1874, he had a startup capital of $5 million. <coughs> in today's money, that would be like saying you had a car powered by angels and being given a $100 million check. In a sense, Keeley was the first Scientologist. <laughs> <laughs> He died in 1898, still fairly rich, and getting a large allowance from a number of factors, including one widow, who gave him $100,000 on the spot. They eventually took apart his machine and found it was powered by compressed air belts. However, people were inspired by Killing's motor. What he essentially did was try to take advantage of some form of energy not known to mankind. His form didn't exist, obviously, because he had a trick in there, but there is one form that has provided a lot of joy to professional motion machines nowadays. It is called zero-point energy, and is the foundation of most modern machines. Due to, quantum, due to some problems with quantum mechanics, or at least some intricacies of it, not exactly problems,